language is messy. In this segment, we're going to talk about the building blocks of language and why they're ambiguous. So the first building block is a morpheme, a morpheme, and that is the smallest unit of meaning. So for example, if we use the word horses, there's two building blocks or bits of meaning in the word horses. There's the word horse, means a horse, and there's the letter S, which means plural. So horses has two units of meaning, two morphemes. Unhappiness has three morphemes. Un, which means I'm not, happy, which means happy, and ness, which means I'm in the process of being happy, except I'm not, so I am unhappy. Three units of meaning. The word yes is just one morpheme, right? You can't, the S by itself in this case, or the Y by itself in this case, doesn't have any particular meaning. ASL has morphemes too. The ASL sign, American Sign Language sign for sit, has two morphemes. That is the sign for movement and the sign for chair. Another building block of language that you use every moment of every day is your lexicon. It's kind of the dictionary of words in your head, but it's not organized like a dictionary. You'll see that in a second. But it's, a lexicon is all the words that you know and the mental representations that go with those words. Um, turns out those words are not organized in alphabetical order as they are in a dictionary, but I'll prove that to you in the next lecture. In your lexicon, you have to relate each word in your lexicon to the sounds that are associated with that word, or the signs or gestures that are associated with that word, but also the spelling of that word. So morpheme, lexicon, phoneme. Phoneme is the smallest sound segments, the smallest bits of sound that if changed are going to change the meaning of the, a word. So bat, B-A-T, b-a-t, three phonemes. Uh, it's got one morpheme, it's got, all together it's got that meaning, but three phonemes. Uh, the French word chat, which means cat, has three phonemes, sh, a, t, so phonemes. Uh, English has 44 phonemes in it. In other words, in English, if you can make the 44 sounds that are part of the English language, then you can say every word that exists in English. So. English has 44 phonemes. Hawaiian, which is a beautifully melodic language, has 13 phonemes. So if you have a smaller number of sounds, you have to make bigger words. So this is a picture of the state fish of Hawaii, and it's called, and I'm sorry to all Hawaiians, I know I'm butchering this, Humahuma Nuku Nuku Apoi A'a, something like that. Long words because of a smaller number of phonemes. All the languages in all the world, as far as we know, have about 200 sounds. So if you could make those 200 sounds, you could say every word in the world. Phonemes also exist in sign language. There's different parameters. The parameters are the shape of your hand, how your hand is moving, where it's located, which way your palm is oriented, and there's also uh, non-manual markers, so facial expression, for example. And each one of those things, as you change it, you change the meaning of the word. Same as in phonemes, but just sign language. So those are the building blocks, right? Morpheme, lexicon, phoneme. Now you'd say, where's the ambiguity? Well, here's the problem with oral speech. You, you get the same thing um, with signs as you do with sounds, but here we go. Um, I'm going to say all of those sentences on the left and the problem for you is going to be that they're all gonna sound like the same sentence if I say them correctly. So let me start with the top one. I made her duck. 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 I made our duck. I made her duck. I made her duck. They all sound the same. Phonemes are really difficult to identify because the sounds that we make change all the time. Each of us has our own accent. Those of us in Southern California think we don't have an accent, 
because our accent is the one that is commonly used on television since so much of television and movies is filmed here in LA. But we all have accents and that creates different sounding phonemes. We all speak at different speeds. That changes what a phoneme looks like. Many phonemes sound alike. The phonemes that I use in the morning are gonna be different from the phonemes that I use at night when I'm tired. So it's very hard to detect phonemes. So how do we do it, right? If phonemes are the building blocks of language, then how do we understand what anybody is saying if we can't identify what the phonemes are? Well, it turns out, as my students will know from previous lectures, we use context, we guess. There's something called the phonemic restoration effect. You gotta know it. Phonemic restoration effect. This is with auditory phonemes. Basically, if you take out a phoneme, the listener will fill it right in. So you could go to a nightclub or a bar and there's lots of noise in the background and the noises in the background are going to block your ability to hear some of the phonemes. But we can have a conversation in a bar or a nightclub or a restaurant because of the phonemic restoration effect. So if there's a sound missing, our brain automatically fills it in. Now, if you're learning a second language, it's much harder to understand what people are saying in noisy environments. And why? Because you don't know as much as about the language, and so you have less information to fill in. There's less restoring information. Here's an example of the phonemic restoration effect. In three clips, I'd like to show you the phonemic restoration effect. In the first clip, there are periods of silence in which phonemes have been effectively removed. In the second clip, the periods of silence have instead been replaced by noise. The noise creates the perception that you'll hear the phonemes even though they're not really there. In the final clip, you'll hear the speech as it originally was. Here it goes. I loved my students. This is an example of the phonemic restoration effect. I loved my students. This is an example of the phonemic restoration effect. I love to teach my students. This is an example of the phonemic restoration effect. Another example of the phonemic restoration effect was done by Warren back in 1970. And you can see that the four sentences that are down at the bottom of the slide have a little asterisk. And that asterisk is where a sound was taken out. So imagine that I say it was found that the eel was on the axle, but right before I say the word eel, there's a cough that blocks your ability to hear that phoneme. What happens? The first sentence where the sound is missing, people hear wheel. The second sentence that's about a shoe, what do they hear? Heel. The third sentence is about an orange, they hear peel. The fourth sentence that's about a table, they hear meal. And what's amazing with this phenomenon is you don't have enough context when you get to the eel word until the end of the sentence, until later. So the context effect actually works backwards in time and we don't notice it. Wild. There's also a restoration effect in sign language. Sign language, signs are just as ambiguous as phonemes, auditory phonemes. People sign in different ways. Um, uh, hearing people sign differently than deaf people. Um, people from different parts of the country have accents that are different. So another one is sometimes the signs are very, very similar, if not the same. So in German sign language, the same sign is used to mean the word color, to mean the word marmalade, which is a kind of jam, right? Made out, love it. Oranges, citrus, mm. How do people figure out whether somebody just said color or marmalade? Well, they look at the signs on either side of that statement, the context, the meaning. We're filling stuff in again. Okay, in making this lecture for my class, you guys have seen some really horrible editing cuts. Much harder than I realized because we live with this illusion that when we speak, that there's a space or a gap between words. And it turns out there's not. Uh, speech is continuous flow. So this uh, set of blobs down at the bottom of the slide you're looking at right now, those are, um, that's a, it's a graph that shows you the energy that comes out of your mouth 
And this one is the energy that comes out of your mouth when you say, my name is Dan Riceberg. My name is Dan Riceberg. Now, notice there's no gap between my and name. It's just one continuous thing. So I didn't actually realize how big of a problem this was until I had to edit um, my videos, which I do a lot because I'm dyslexic and weird words come out of my mouth all the time. It's very strange. Um, but it's very hard to edit when there's no gap between the words. So you end up with these edits of me saying, and so bleh. we have to use top-down knowledge to interpret phonemes because they are ambiguous. So for example, if I say the sky is falling or the sky is falling, it's two different sentences. I just said the top one and then the bottom one. They mean two different things, but they sound identical. This is a Gary Larson cartoon. So again, here is another graph of the energy that comes out of somebody's mouth when they say, where are the silences between words? There aren't any. So we have to use context. We have to use meaning. We have to use the rules of language. We have to use experience, statistical learning to make sense of things. Oh, one thing I, I want to mention here. Have you ever noticed when you hear someone speak a language that you don't know, it sounds like the language runs all together. It's like they never take a break. It's just continuous gobbledygook that you can't make sense of. It turns out that when people who don't know English hear you speak, that's what you sound like to them. The illusion that there's gaps between words, that only happens with languages that you know. So if you know a language, then you experience gaps between the words. If you don't know the language, then it sounds like one big, well, it sounds like what it actually is, one big continuous stream of sound. Isn't that wild? Come back and we'll do a cool demo.